everybody. Welcome to 2022. It's hard to believe we're in a new year, in a new month, and a new opportunity. And join us as we finish out our messages we're learning from the life of Christ. We've been talking about Christmas at home, personalizing what we have romanticized, emphasizing what we've kind of excluded, and maybe separating out so much of the tradition from the historical fact. And this is so applicable to our country, our culture, and I know it'll be applicable to you as we look at the life of Joseph and we discover the power of righteous obedience. Grab your Bible, download the notes on the app, hardvalleychurch.com slash app, and thank you again. Thanks, by the way, all of you who have been so faithful in contributing and your generosity in helping us as we press toward our Christmas giving goal, and we're excited to share that. You can look online and uh, see the totals, and as we begin to impact the world with your giving to missions, and as we begin to redo some things around the lobby, or excuse me, the outside of the church. Thanks for joining us. God bless. Join us right now. Standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let His praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and see Standing on the promises of God Standing, standing Standing on the promises of God my Savior Standing, standing I'm standing on the promises of God Standing on the promises that cannot fail When the howling storms of doubt and fear assail By the living word of God I shall prevail Standing on the promises of God Standing, standing Standing on the promises of God my Savior Standing, standing the promises of God Standing on the promises I now can see Perfect present cleansing in the blood for me Standing in the liberty where Christ makes free Standing on the promises of God Standing, standing Standing on the promises of God, my Savior, standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises of Christ the Lord, bound to Him eternally by love's strong cord. Overcoming daily with the Spirit's sword Standing on the promises of God Standing, standing Standing on the promises of God my Savior Standing, standing I'm standing on the promises of God Standing on the promises I cannot fall Listening every moment to the Spirit's call Resting in my Savior as my all in all Standing on the promises of God Standing, standing Standing on the promises of God my Savior Standing, standing promises of God. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn King. Peace on earth and mercy mild, God and sinners reconciled. Joyful all ye nations rise, join the triumph of the skies with angelic hope. 
was proclaimed. Christ is born in Bethlehem. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn King. Christ by highest heaven adored, Christ the I have the same feeling now that I have typically around uh, Easter, and, uh, and that is, man, we really, <laughs> we really uh, should do more of this other than a season. Uh, you ever feel that way? And, uh, you know, we talk about Jesus' birth at uh, December, and we'll talk about his death and resurrection somewhere March, April, somewhere uh, around there, and we seem very constricted on something that should be should be a, maybe a, a, a triumphant, a triumphant verse every, maybe every other week. I, the early church put us to shame in that sense because they constantly talked about his resurrection. <clears throat> they were the church of the resurrection so much so they moved from Saturday to Sunday because that was the Lord's day, the day that he arose from the grave. So I get the, I get the uh, the protester in me right now going, all right, we're singing. We're singing at least a Christmas song a month from the rest of the year. Everybody nod your head if you're with me, and we'll sing a resurrection song. And, and uh, we, we, uh, we do a lot worse than that, amen? And uh, so I, I appreciate that. Thank you again. And we do, uh, as we're looking forward to what God has for us, man, we're, we're so thrilled. Let me say thank you again and uh, uh, for what, uh, what you're doing and what you're wanting to do uh, here as we look ahead, January, we've got a, a special musical group going to come in and kind of as we celebrate uh, 2022, and they'll be here the third week of January, and then Andrew Wood will be with us from the Hope Resource Center talking about what you are partnering with that organization helping folks in crisis, particularly ladies in crisis and families, and doing more than just don't do this, but here's an alternative path. Here's a path to wholeness. Here's a path to you and your child. You and your child, maybe those unplanned or unprepared for, but we're going to help you prepare. We're going to give you opportunity and training, and, and, and they're doing so many things. And, and, and then giving the gospel along with that, not just something medical or, or counseling. And so they'll be with us the first Sunday of February. And as we make sure, and we double down doing our part to reach our Jerusalem and our Judea and our Samaria and the uttermost parts of the world simultaneously making sure that the light of the gospel is bright. Thank you for what you're doing. And so 
And so we're just uh, so, so appreciative of that. And we'll say a little more at the end of the service, but, but thank you for that. And one of the ways you're doing that, <clears throat> and a lot of you have uh, picked this up, I understand. I, I get a little uh, graphic that kind of shows me um, uh, percentages and all for the year. And a lot of you have enjoyed the online giving option we've had now for a lot of years, to be honest with you. And so thank you. Those of you who enjoy using that, and again, if you ever have any problems or snags or something, just let the church office know, or you can, I can't help you with any particulars, but I can help with the, uh, the, the, the interface, and so we'll be glad to do that, but thank you so much, and those of you like in using that, and, uh, and, we, uh, and we just, uh, we're just so amazed at what God is doing, and uh, some of our missionaries, uh, the Simmons, first time the Seizure people have ever celebrated the Lord's table. They got to do that this year at Christmas time. They got done with the service, by the way. They, they had people who just came from all over and were thrilled to be able to do this and, and honor the Lord and remember what He's done. They said they're walking in their house and said she, she, she feels like she needs to look down and she looks down and there's a black mamba, deadly first strike kind of death right in the doorway as Satan's just whispering and, and slithering at him, hey, don't forget about me. And you're helping them stay on the front lines fighting the forces of darkness and shedding, spreading the gospel of light. And you're getting to do that as well with the Hamptons. And so we're so appreciative for them and we're thankful. This is a father-son team and they have moved house, hearth, and home. God has moved them from a temporary location, given them a permanent location now. They've been able to retrofit that, redo that, and uh, they had their first candlelight service and had children sing and, and just all these. And these are first generations Christians by and large. There's some folks that's kind of moved in the area, but you're getting to help with them. You're getting to help plant a seed in the, in the upper Northwest <clears throat> and to plant a church rather. And as they're sowing seeds, you have a part in this. And we're just so, so very thankful. And uh, Clayton, in, uh, of course, started a church out in the Clarksville area in Tennessee, and now they're there. So thank you for that. So thank you for your generosity. You, you ever feel like, man, I, I, I'm stuck. I can't do some things I want to do. Anybody besides me, you know, whether it's a COVID stuff or, or just, you know, pandemic or, <clears throat> or you just, you know, you can't, the laws of physics, you can't be in two places at one time. Anybody ever feel like you got more you want to do than you can do? <clears throat> Every now and then I go, man, I just hop on a plane, go spend a week with the Hamptons. I mean, whatever I can do to help you. Whatever I can do to help you. When I would take groups on, on mission trips and all, I'd, I'd, I'd get them there and, and I'd look at the, whoever the missionary, the pastor was. I'd say, what do you need us to do? What can we only do these uh, six, ten days, twelve days we're here with you? And uh, one of the things you can do is you can pray for the Hamptons. One of the things you can do is continue to help hold their hands up again. Is they're just pushing against darkness. I heard a fellow say one time, speaking of this area, this region, <clears throat> he said, you can't go and preach. <clears throat> that uh, your grandmother would be so proud of you making a decision for Christ. He said, because grandma didn't know Jesus. Truth of the matter is, grandma about me kind of sawed off that you're in church. There is no historical legacy of faith in this area. These are all people coming to grips with the gospel in the flesh for the first time. All they've ever known is what's been parodied on television and in movies. And they're breaking new ground for the gospel. And I like holding their hands. Amen. I like supporting them. Thank you so much for that. And they're part of our Christmas uh, emphasis as well. They were part of our Christmas emphasis. And so we're so appreciative of that. So appreciate that. I hope as you came in, maybe you got a handout. <clears throat> maybe you got something. We're doing a family service today. So everybody's kind of staying put. We do have a lot of folks who are still traveling and sent their regards. And, <clears throat> and, uh, and so we appreciate them uh, checking in, and we're, we're thankful. But we need the Word this morning. Anybody need the Word this morning? Man, I need the Word. I need God to speak to my heart, and I need, to, I need some help in, in just all kinds of areas. And so I want to I make sure that I've got that kind of help. We're just going to read a few verses this morning. <clears throat> Pardon me. Is there anything I'm forgetting? I'm not sending the kids out. It's kind of messing with my... Yeah. Can you hear me? I forgot the memory verses. That's what I'm forgetting. Thank you. Is that what you're doing, Riley? Memory verses? 
Those of you who can see the beginning, if you ain't back, back translate, yeah. I understood Mike. I didn't understand my own child. I pray for me as a parent. Uh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I, thought, I thought he was saying he was hot. And I was like, there's nothing I can do about that up here. And uh, so my bad, right? <laughs> Take your coat off. I do. <clears throat> anybody have anybody talk to them? You don't know what they're saying? <laughs> All right. Well, it's just, just not me. Some of you didn't. What did you say? So let's, uh, for the last time in, uh, in this passage, let's stand. We'll say our verses together. Thank you so much. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Sorry. I was just as tickled as I can be. I didn't know what this was. So now you'll never forget these verses. Luke chapter 2, 8, 9, 10, 11. If you've got them, you don't need to look at the screen or your tablet or anything. But if not, help yourself out. <clears throat> and, let's, and let's try and do these together. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. Verse 9. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. Verse 10. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. Verse 11. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. If you did a good job, give yourself a hand this morning. All right, you can be seated. And if you did an okay job, you can give yourself a hand as well. <clears throat> and so thankful. Matthew chapter 1, we've been here most of the month, most of the series. And we've been talking about Christmas at home. <clears throat> and I don't mean that in the sentimental sense. And I, I love tradition. I love sentimentality. I really do. <clears throat> um, but I've not been talking about that. I've been talking about this becoming more than just part of the garland and the holly and the ivy. It's become more than just the talk about the person, people who deliver toys and in in the in the in the uh, in the uh, <coughs> excuse me in the supernatural type of uh, uh, realms of of uh, magic and mystery and. And all, all of that kind of uh, thing that, uh, that we so seem to play up. I, making it personal to you. Making sure that Christmas doesn't just slide by like a date on a calendar. And so we've tried to emphasize that best we can in this series. And, and I want to really bring it home. I'm going to focus on the life of Joseph, the stepfather of Christ, and, and see what we can learn from his life. Am I good back there, guys? Let me check my... Let me check this. Thank you again. Sorry about my lack of communication there. Yeah, there we go. So verse 19, and, uh, and I just had you sit down. My apologies for getting things out of order. Would you stand one more time? We read God's word together. Maybe preacher get his act together now. Maybe so. Verse 19, then Joseph, her husband, being a just man. The word just is saying we get justified or righteous. Being a just man, not willing to make her a public example was minded to put her away privately. Verse 24, Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel the Lord had bidden him, took unto him his wife, and knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son. And he called his name Jesus, the power of righteous obedience. Would you pray with me, Father? Lord, I've been excited about visiting, again, this character, this one that just doesn't get a lot of... A lot of uh, uh, time mentioned in the scripture. There's not a lot of emphasis, but Lord, his life speaks volumes. And so teach us what we need to know from this young man. Remind us, Lord, of what looks like righteousness and virtue in a messed up modern world. And would you challenge us this morning? Father, we love you and we need you today. Holy Spirit, I pray you'd use me and fill me. I pray that you'd guard me, guard my heart, Lord, in, in a time when so many are dishonoring you, Father. May, may that never be the case connected to this church, this ministry. May, may we never do things that dishonor you. And would you remind us again as you have reminded me, Lord, what it means and what it looks like to try and live for you. I pray you'd help us. Speak to every heart I ask and pray in your son's wonderful name. And amen. You can be seated. You can be seated. A couple questions. Need a little bit of help here. Need a little bit of help. We'll get going because I was thinking, man, everybody's full, full of food, full of turkey, full of leftover turkey, full over whatever you had, full over ham. 
and uh, some of you, some of you got round two, or round three coming along, and and you're not quite done yet. Some of you got Tupperware that needs to be gone through, and then then there'll be casseroles and hash and whatnot, and all those kind of things. So I thought I might be talking to a sleepy, weary uh, place. I talked to one fellow this week. He's like. He's like, uh, I'm going to go see family. And that was great. And then he said, and then the family's going to follow us home. I said, is that good or not? He said, have you got a room? And uh, so I thought maybe I'd get a little bit of help this morning, a little bit of help. So help me with the first one there. Anybody know how that one goes? Try before you buy. Try before you buy. How many of you think it's try before you buy? Try before you buy. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Is it a good thing? Yes. Bad thing? No. Good thing? Bad thing, good thing, bad thing. And all our kids, again, we're having the uh, service, family service. Uh, make sure you've got, uh, we got some coloring stuff and all for you if you need that. Try before you buy. Number two, better to ask for something than something else. Better to ask for forgiveness. Some of you said it the best way, and others of you said it the way your mouth says it. Better to ask for forgiveness than permission. Anybody ever heard that one? Anybody ever practice that one? Better to ask for forgiveness than permission. Then the third one there, I don't know you'll get that uh, necessarily, but you have your and I have my. Anybody? You have your way, I have my way. That's not wrong. You have your opinion, I have my opinion. And that's been supplanted by what Bill just said. You got your truth and I got my truth. You got your truth and I got my truth. Now, out of all of these, of course, number two is not right. <laughs> um, but uh, out of all of these, the third one is the, is the, is the weirdest one, right? Because you can't have multiple truths. Nod your head if you understand why that just doesn't work at all. Doesn't work at all. Uh, you know, I like to illustrate it this way. You can go outside and get a sleeping bag and sleep in a parking spot, and you're not going to wake up in the morning in a Volkswagen. Uh, you're not... You're entitled to your opinion, but you're just not entitled to your truth. You're not entitled to your truth. You can't, you can't do that. And so, and part of, and we see that just completely receding. And, and, and again, you talk generationally to people, and they will say the kookiest things to you with all the sincerity in their hearts because they've been told somewhere that as long as you feel strongly enough about it, then that's your truth, your truth. And I don't know exactly how to come back from that precipice apart from the scriptures apart from reminding them there is the truth of the bible there is the truth that jesus christ is the way the truth and, like, and, and getting back to those true north kind of things and so when we're looking at this i want to understand i want you to understand we're talking about a righteous life and righteous obedience we're talking about the life of joe that this is just completely out of sorts in today's world just completely out of sorts and it's completely out of sorts culturally, culturally, <coughs> excuse me, James Emery White has written and researched quite a bit. He's done things with Pew Research people and with the Barnard Group. And he's concluded, he's concluded that the rise of the religious nuns, N-O-N-E-S, is not just escalating, but it's becoming more dominant. As people say and don't identify with anything, and they claim that, and they claim one of those things. Well, I've got my truth, or I deny the very existence of truth. Well, how in the world do you talk about righteous living and obedience when, when, when everybody here pretty much try before you buy, and that's true. Some people in marriage, some people in other things. Well, I'll do this, I'll do that, or better to ask for forgiveness. So it's not important to live right. It's just important to get somebody to 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 square off with you there, and then finally. You can have your truth and I have my truth. No, 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 it's just the truth, just the truth. And so we're looking at that. I, I want to acknowledge what I'm about to say is it, it'd, be, it'd be like somebody from Fox News and CNN having lunch. <clears throat> May not be a lot of eating, but there's going to be a lot of discussion. And so, but I'm not here to discuss. I'm here to present. This is what the Bible says. This is what the Bible says. So what does it look like? What did it look like in his life? And I want to give you several key things from his life. What lessons does Joseph, the stepfather of Jesus, teach us? If you're with me, say amen. I'll try and, be, I'll try and use my time well, but I want to help us this morning. Number one, the ability to obey God does not depend upon age. The ability to, depend, to obey God does not depend on age. 
when I get a little older, when I get retired, when I do this, when I do that, when I know the Lord a little bit better, when I've read my Bible a little bit more, whatever it is, no, it, you can do that. Andre and I is a, a one of Andre's dear friends. I got to know him later in life. <coughs> Shane Lewis, Shane Pastor down in the Birmingham, Alabama area. Shane and I were cancer buddies. Shane won his fight with cancer Father's Day of this year, graduated on to heaven. Shane had an expression that I love. He used to say, young people will always rise to the level of our expectations. Young people will always rise to the level of our expectations. It's not enough. It's not enough to just say, well, they're this, and they'll sow their oats and all. Again, you're, you're presuming two or three things that are not in evidence. One, you're presuming they're going to keep living. I've lived long enough and been in ministry long enough <clears throat> that I've buried enough folks who never got to 20, who never got to 25, who never started a family. I've occasionally been there and buried newlywed. <clears throat> Excuse me, a lady reached out to me as part of a kind of a group thing the other day, and it was the anniversary of her son's passing. He was 20 years old. He had been in Bible college, and she just reminiscing again, passed away right before Christmas, and just included me. I felt honored to do that. I'm not trying to scare you. I'm just saying, you've got now to live for Jesus. you got now to live for Jesus. And Joseph, here's a young man, say, how do you know? How do you know? Because this, the Bible story indicates that, and we get that from Luke, we get that from Matthew. Mary, at best, is past puberty, but probably not even 18 at the time. This was a very common age. And he, has been, um, he is old enough to have gotten some money saved up. He started the betrothal process, the engagement process. And these are two young people. Common for the culture, it seems a little young for us. You got to understand, we had presidents who finished college, by the way, in the U.S. at 14 or 15. And so we've moved the scale as far as adulthood a little bit in our world, but for their world, and again, they are just barely out of home, and they are doing what, man? He's going to obey and follow Christ. I would encourage us this morning that if you're waiting till tomorrow, if you're waiting for whatever's coming, if you're waiting when, when I get retired, when I do this, when I do that, if you've got a whole list of things, till I learn a little more of the scriptures, till I get a little more in church, till I do this. Now you've got today to live for Jesus. Today to live for Jesus. One of the things I've been praying for the last month is God, help us get our young people more plugged in our church. God help us. Lord, we help them, get them to serve, get them comfortable talking to young people. Lord, if we can start back our Sunday school and some of these ministry programs that we let, we let kind of go idle during, <coughs> during COVID, God help us, man, give them the heart and the integrity to do this, Lord. And I, and I prayed and I thought the other day, man, wouldn't it be wonderful to have some join us more on the stage and the music? And God, would you just do that in our hearts and our lives because it's not about age serving God. Man, it's about heart. It's about dedication. You can be 30, you can be 80, and you can make all the excuses in the world, and Joseph could have done any of those. But here's what he does. He walks in integrity of heart, and he says, I'm going to serve God even though it's not convenient or simple or easy. I'm going to serve God. See, I believe young people read your Bible. I believe young people learn verses. Let me help you. I believe middle-aged folks can read your Bible and learn verses and pray. <laughs> A friend of mine said they were adopting for their church, their church theme this year. <laughs> read, pray, worship, and live. I said, I thought Eat was in there. He said, that's the movie. And uh, I said, well, I'm a Baptist. I'm throwing that one in there if I steal it. And uh, read and pray and worship and live. That wouldn't be a bad plan for the year, would it? And to do those things, you can do that regardless of age. Let me help you. I've known young people. I've known third, fourth, fifth, sixth graders never miss a day reading their Bible. I've watched them walk into a WANA program before and rattle off 10, 15 verses. I've been challenged and occasionally ashamed, ashamed by young people who stepped up and stood up. Would that be a lesson to us who think we're just so busy? Let me remind us, we're doing a whole lot of good stuff, but we may not be doing the most important stuff. And we need to quit making excuses to God. One of the things we get from the life of Joseph or Alphabet is age. The ability to obey God doesn't depend upon age. Number two, we're going to get from his life that sexual strength before marriage is possible and it honors God. Now, I told you I was going to be a little controversial. I told you I was going to just kind of swap my way around to 21 and 22, 2021, 2022. 
Because this one just completely out the window, isn't it? Because the first thing I said, right? Try before you buy. <laughs> Better to ask for forgiveness and permission. You got your truth, I got mine. Well, all that matters is that all that matters is that we love each other. Well, that's great that you love each other. But if you love them really, man, go ahead and do what's right. Sexual restraint before marriage is possible. I, I want to focus on a few areas. You still with me? Some of you with me? Some of you taking notes? Some of you wondering what kind of service you walked into here at the end of the year? Go, go look with me in the scripture. <clears throat> You're in Matthew chapter 1 again. <clears throat> go with me over. Uh, going back to, <coughs> excuse me, go to verse 19. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privately. Skip down to verse 24. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, his angel Lord had bidden him and took him his wife, and knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. Joseph kept the integrity of the virgin birth, and even though it was legal and permissible, he exercised restraint. He exercised restraint. I'm, I'm undone by the permissiveness on television. No more than I watch anything that's pretty modern. I'm undone by the permissiveness in, on, on movies. I'm undone by the permissiveness in things aimed at 4th, 5th, 6th, and 7th graders. <clears throat> I believe, I don't, I don't want to misspeak, I'm almost certain that's when we got rid of cable years ago when we were watching some uh, Nickelodeon type programming and it was completely geared toward you are doing well if you're bed hopping. And again, they were marketing this at preteens, showing what should have been teenagers hopping in and out of people's beds and kissy face and all this kind of stuff. And I just want to help you here that that's, that's not the biblical principle. By the way, in corrupting and in instructing those young minds is something unbelievably uh, erroneous and sinful and wicked. And he gives it to us here. There's three areas I, I just want to help us with. There's the physical, there's the mental, and the emotional. <clears throat> I, I, believe you can, I believe you can emotionally mess up here a long time before the physical. I, I, believe, I believe the ease of cell phones and, and the laxness in the workplace is just, is just murdering us here. And people give their hearts away a long time before they ever, ever start with a kissy face. And you be careful. You be unbelievably careful. There's an emotional, there's a mental, there's a mental. I gave you a quote there that Joseph was faithful to his future spouse in advance awaiting marriage and expecting the same in return. <clears throat> We, we walk around with one of the greatest tools, most of us, that has ever existed. Any answer we want might not be right, but is available at our fingertips. And we gladly give it to children and teenagers and young adults with almost no capability, no filter, no anything in the world of wickedness at their fingertips. We do so foolishly. We do so foolishly. I was part of a discussion slash argument. Should you check your kids and teenagers cell phones and text messages and I laughed out loud man what do you mean should you how often should you is the question somebody say amen to that man I'm <clears throat> for years and years and just and we stop this and I say this kind of to my detriment we stopped this personally with Andre and I when email became overwhelming but for years and years Years and years, if a lady was messaging me or, or emailing me, I, I copied Andre on it. I copied Andre on it until it just, it just and again, if you deal with a lot of email, you just, there's, just, there's just a point that's just overwhelming. So what we did was, what we did was we just turned every screen around in the house and we made sure that everybody had everybody's password. And so every so often, I hadn't done it lately, but every so often, here, whatever you want to look at, check anything, come over here and look at it. In fact, I found a way to give credentials to her and she can with a couple of clicks can get right in my inbox and all because I need all the help I can get because I don't want to give my heart away emotionally and I don't need any anything other than all the restriction in the world mentally mentally I'm stunned by the number of men with years of marriage behind them get caught in this area and they're not mad they're not they're not sad, they're mad. 
They're mad that they got caught. They're mad they got to explain themselves. And they have just completely perverted everything that's honorable and holy about marriage. I get laughed at every now and then. I tell people if I ever travel, I never cut on the TV. It's laughable now because I've got cell phone and stuff because it's much worse. But I just, too many times I've been in a hotel and clicking around, I go, what's that, what's that? And all of a sudden, man, I'm in a world of mess. And I got nobody there. And so occasionally I'll cut on the weather, but again, whatever I need, I've got on my phone now. But I, I, I want it to be that way because, because it's, it honors God. And it is possible to do this. See, why would you preach in that? Why'd you preach? Because the message of Christmas has become about carols and bells and tinsel and holly. And here you've got a young man with all his life in front of him and nobody's going to know. And he's going to do the right thing just simply because it pleases God. Simply because it pleases God. It honors it. And then there's the obvious there, the, the physical, the physical. And I want to encourage us again that this is possible and this honors God. He is supposed to do this. He's supposed to do this. And let me help us and encourage us. And, and I, don't, I don't know where we got this. And I had this discussion with a couple of parents in our church the other day. There, there, there is not enough kissy face in the world to fill the hole that's in your heart. that God created. And being this and being that and dressing this way and cutting your hair and, and growing your hair and all, all this kind of stuff. Somebody has told you if you do that, you'd feel better. Let me remind you, the only way to be whole is to be holy. And that only comes from being forgiven by God. And sexual restraint is possible, is possible. You still with me? Say amen. Number three, let me help you here. Let me help you out. And I gave you that quote. <clears throat> Marriage is more than love. Marriage is more than love. It's about costly commitment. I want to explain the last one there because some of you are going, you're having to fit. But just uh, give me a second. It's about costly commitment. <clears throat> Anybody like me growing up, you thought, thought love was a, just an emotion? What I knew about love, I learned from coffee commercials, right? Times like these were made for tasters. Was anybody remember those commercials where they'd run across the field? I don't know what that'd do with coffee. But anyway, they'd run across the field and they'd catch each other. Uh, thank the Lord that the Hallmark Channel wasn't available when I was coming along, and, uh, which we didn't have cable anyway. But, and, and, those, and I say that, I'm keeping picking on Hallmark. But man, it was, it was just there. I'm not real convinced that I wasn't sure that, man, when I got married, my wife was supposed to make me happy. That to be married was to find happiness. And what I figured out pretty quickly was it wasn't her job to make me happy. It wasn't my job to make her happy. I'm supposed to find my happiness in the Lord, and we're supposed to be two sinners working on each other and, and, and trying to be committed to one another. Once you figure out that love is a commitment, not just an emotion, then things get a whole lot simpler in your heart and your life. And here's Joseph, man, and he loves her, but he doesn't know her that well. They couldn't have had a lot of time together. And here he is, and he thinks she has cheated on him. How do you know? Because he's going to put her away. He's going to we'll take an actual right of writ of divorcement, the same as if they had actually consummated the marriage and gone through the whole ceremony and all those kind of... The same thing is there. He's going to do that. And he's humiliated. And he cares enough about her. He's going to try and do it in such a way that minimizes the impact to her. But, I mean, she's toast. She is the stain of cheating on him. She's going to be an unwed mother. She will be financially decimated. Her family doesn't believe her. Prove it. Her extended family won't let her stay in the house. They make her go have the baby in the barn. Joseph's going to disown her. He can sue and get the dowry. He can keep it. He can be more financially well off. He can have an asterisk beside his name, but he can, go, he can go and marry again. It will just devastate her. And he's going to try and be as easy as he can. God comes to him in a dream. An angel speaks to him, says, don't be fearful. What's done in Mary, she's telling you the truth. What's happening in Mary's belly is of the Holy Spirit. And she is, she is exactly who she says she is. You go ahead and you follow me. See, marriage is more than love. 
It is about costly commitment. Why well, I like ceremonies where people redo their vows. I choose you again. I choose you. I, I'm in this again. I would gladly do this again. I will serve you again. We will serve one another. We will honor one another. We will love one another. Some years ago, that's my time. We, we were, it was our first ministry where I was a senior pastor and, and man, just lots of fun. And uh, we had a family start coming to our church. He ran his own business and man, he came and, and uh, he came and, and they wanted to be involved. His, his, his beautiful wife and just stair step children, two or three children. And I, I noticed that every time they came to church, it wasn't just normal been fussing before they got there. It, it, looked like, it looked like nuclear war had gone on. I didn't think much about it. Three kids, truth of the matter is, having three children that small makes me sweat right now. And, and I, I just figured it was normal getting them ready, getting them fed, making sure everybody's got a shoe. You know, nod your head if you, if you think that way. And it kept on going. And, uh, and one of the kids, the older kid, walking out and says, Preacher, pray for Dad. He's living in the RV. And I went, okay. Everybody's walking by. He shakes my hand. You, you know that phony politician handshake? I'm going to steal all your money, but it's glad to see you, neighbor. He gave me one of those. She came by. She couldn't look me in the eye. She said something, you know, nice sermon. Wasn't as long as last week. I don't know what she said. And uh, she came by and said something, but the little girl's thing kind of stuck with me. I couldn't get away from it. We went out to eat with a couple we were supposed to that Sunday. <clears throat> Drop everybody back at home. Allison's just a, uh, just a baby. I go, Andre, I'm going over there. It's just a few blocks away. I drive over the house. Beautiful brick home, two-story, a colonial, uh, a colonial type of house, big columns, huge, uh, ever how many feet RV, and, and the huge uh, driveway. They've got a special shed for it and all this kind of stuff. I go out, and I can't get anybody. And of course, it's nap time. And, and, and I see that the door's open on the RV, and I go up to the RV, and then I realize I don't know the etiquette for a recreational vehicle. Do you knock? Is there a bell? Do you peek in the window? You may know these things. I did not. I didn't know what the etiquette was, so I announced my president. Hello, anybody there? And I tap on the screen, and he comes to the door. God's my witness. He's got a can of beans or something in his hand and a spoon. He says, well, preacher, this is a surprise, or pastor, this is a surprise. I went, yeah, me too. And uh, what you doing in the RV? What you doing in the RV? And he makes up some lie about he's cleaning or checking it out. I said, okay. Well, that's, uh, I didn't know what to do. Your daughter came through and she said, pray for dad, he's living in an RV, but you, you, she's confused, you're just cleaning it. He drops his head. No, I've been out here for weeks now. What do you mean you've been out here for weeks? I mean, you got a beautiful two-story colonial brick, blah, blah, blah right here. Yeah. He said, we're, we're, we're having trouble. I said, what do you mean you're having trouble? He starts in on this, and he says, well, to be honest, he said, uh, he said, I've got a girlfriend. I went from confused and curious to furious all in about 90 seconds. Anybody ever have that range of emotions come over you? And he's standing there with the can and the spoon, and I'm standing there looking up at him as he's in the doorway of his RV, because he didn't know etiquette either. He didn't invite me in. I'm standing there looking up the doorway. I said, what do you mean you got a girlfriend? I went from pastor to prophet. Well, we just, and this was his either, when, by the time I met him, this was his second or third relationship that I knew anything about. And he said, I just don't, I just don't feel it anymore. And I said, I said, feel what? Again, I'm, I'm completely on auto impulse now. What do you mean you don't feel it? I said, you got three kids. You got a wife that you put a ring on her finger. You, 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 your feelings may come and they may go. 
And he's like, well, we've already started the process and, and all these kind of things. He's already bought an engagement ring for this woman. I looked at him and I said, I said, she will, you will leave your wife for this woman knowing you're married, and that woman will leave you for somebody else. Now, I didn't know that, but again, I was feeling fairly prophetic, and I was pretty mad. Because this man's throwing away everything he's got for a feeling that's going to fade. It ain't young love, it's new love. Guess what? All new love turns into same, same love. And I can give you something better than love, and that's commitment. And commitment. I made a commitment to Christ. By the way, that's why I like church weddings. In the sight of God and all these witnesses. Now, let me help you. Because there's going to be some grace at the end of this. Don't miss me. Don't miss me. If you feel like I'm whacking you with a two-by-four, if you're watching and you're going, man, he preaches really strong, I want to give you the hope of Christmas in just a moment. But Joseph is standing out saying that it is possible it is possible to do this. I've got two things here. Adultery and infidelity are always sinful. God help us, whatever you're watching, whatever you're streaming, whatever your recreational reading is, if they're championing this, then you need to find something else to watch. You need to find something else to read. You need to find another podcast to listen to. Don't celebrate what God condemns. Somebody say amen to that. And we've got to get there. Adultery is always sinful, always sinful. We were watching Andre and I, I don't know if the kids were even along. We were watching some sappy movie, and I got sucked in, and I'm sitting there, and we're sharing a bowl of popcorn, and all of a sudden the twist comes, and the twist is that they're rooting for this woman to leave her husband. And I look at Andre and says, we're done. She says, I got to know how it ends. I said, I don't care how it ends. I'm not emotionally going to get sucked in and cheering for somebody to do the wrong thing. Not going to do it. They're always sinful. Always sinful. You say, but, 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 no, there, there's no commas, there's no asterisk here. This is not a passage, by, secondly, on divorce. This is not. But it gives us a little inclination. Righteous, just Joseph was going to do what he was bound up to do. See, when, there's a, when there is the biblical uh, set of divorce, and again, somewhere between God hates divorce... And Moses gave you a writ of divorce because the hardness of your heart is a scriptural balance. And that's not the point of the sermon, but somewhere in there is what the Bible speaks to it about. If you'll just allow me to visit that at a later sermon, so for time's sake. And Joseph is fulfilling this. Because usually divorce is only codifying what's already happened. There's been an intractable heart. There's been all this infidelity. There's been all these kind of things. There's been the person who has walked away from that and all, all these other. So if you'll just allow me that little bit of space. Divorce is not always sinful. It's not always evil. Sometimes it's just simply the recognition of what's already gone on. Somewhere in between God hates divorce and Moses gave you the red. I really do think there's a balance. But if you'll just allow that for a second. And divorce may be just fine. Again, we have no... Nothing here condemning him. But it's going to leave two wounded people. It's going to leave two wounded people. You be real careful in your counsel to people. Let it, let it be the last thing. And then when you find that wounded person, God didn't call you to pour salt on their wound. God called you to pour salve on it. Come alongside of them and say, you matter and you have worth. And that's an act and an event. And that's not going to define the rest of your life. And the God of grace and glory can take you from where you are and teach you the new skills that you need and move and motivate you forward. And for far too long, by the way, for far too long, we have shamed young women. And shame folks who didn't have anything, and it was their fault, and it was part of that, and it takes two to fight, and I know all those things. But instead of saying you have worth, and you have value, and you are loved, and we've let the young man kind of slide, because that's what young men do. And I want to encourage us again to go back and look and say, man, there's two wounded people, and the church is a place of help and healing and recovery and restoration, and quit treating people like lepers and just say, hey, Jesus loves you and He died for you and the Savior can change your life. 
We've been teaching what marriage and relationships are all about. Doesn't that sound like a better formula? Somebody say amen. Better formula. Number three, number four. Number four. Trust God enough to obey Him. <laughs> Trust God enough to obey Him. Your fiancé has been faithful to you. You can go forward with this. It's just three verses. Luke says almost less. Trust God enough to obey Him. Anybody ever been counseling, talking to somebody, and you just got so desperate you started, well, I can, I can tie them. I can tie them to a post in the room. They won't listen. Anybody? Just stand right here. Let me whack you until you listen. Anybody, anybody gotten that frustrated with somebody or that? If you'd have told me 30 years almost in, I'd have to constantly tell people they're not in church. They don't seem to love God. I don't care if they're pretty. I don't care if he's got bushy hair. I don't care if he smells good. I don't care if she looks nice in a red dress. Man, it ain't right because they don't know God. They're not involved with the things of the Lord. You got no business chasing after them. Oh, but I love them, man. I love, I love salted caramel too, but I'm not about to marry because it ain't good for me. And, uh, and, and do this. And then to get into it, and eight months later, life's a mess. And they're going, oh, preacher, what should I do? You should have listened to me to start with, you big dummy. And I uh, should have listened to the Bible. But I don't do that because that's not, that's not nice. I'm just I'm exaggerating here a little bit. We're there. Joseph here. <laughs> Can you imagine? What are you doing marrying that girl? Did you do that to her? Are you the reason she's expecting See, Joseph's got a value commitment rather than his own honor and reputation. You bunch of no good Christians, all you're interested in is this and that. All you're interested in money. All you're interested in this. All you're interested in is politics. All these kind of, and all this stuff. And unfortunately, sometimes it's like it sticks because, because, the, because the bigger the recognition, the bigger it is when somebody messes up or does something they ought not to do. And it's going to cost you. It's going to cost you. It's going to cost being misunderstood. The second idea that's there, Joseph's obedience to God cost him the right to value his own reputation. My pastor, Dan Patrick, he's a teenager. He said a singing group in the Bible College in Nashville would come through. He said it was odd how they even scheduled the service. They came through. His family was, if the doors were open, we were going to be in church. He said, so it was a Tuesday night, and it came through. He said, it was a ladies' trio. He said, and they sang. He said, and all I can think about, man, those ladies are pretty. A guy got up and talked about a place he'd never heard about, talked about Bible college. He said, I, never even, I didn't know anything that was such a thing. I knew Ohio State University. I knew the people that played Ohio State University, the Ohio State University. That was, that was all I knew. He said, God began to work in our heart. My heart began to work in my parents' heart. He said, and I loaded up the car and drove, <coughs> and drove from Massillon, Ohio to Nashville, Tennessee, never having stepped foot on the campus, found my way around, found a roommate uh, that would become a lifelong friend. He said, and went to the first Bible classes I'd ever been to, public school all my life. He said, God began to radically change my life. He said, it was like every chapel service, man, they were zeroing in on, on Dan's sin. You ever been in those services? He said, when I went home that summer, he said, I went to the same job I'd always had, working at the theater. He said, my best friend was there. He said, I'd made a commitment to do and, do and live differently. And said, said, a lot of times after work, they'd all go and they'd, they'd, they'd go and, and hang out in corrals and stuff like that. And they'd go wash their cars and, and, and do things they ought not do. And he said, I made a decision before I came home, I wasn't doing that anymore. He said, so first night of work, he said he gets done, said his best buddy's going, hey, you coming car wash? We're going to do this and that. No, I can't. He said, and that was night after night. He said, finally, about a weekend. He said, his friend looked at him and said, I was going to invite you to the car wash. We're going to go and hang out. And I said, but you're not coming, are you? He said, no, I'm not. He said, 
He said, I knew it. He said, do you think you're better than we are? Think you're too good for the rest of us? He said, but I guarantee you by the end of the summer, you'll be hanging out at the car wash with us. Brother Dan said, what sounds funny now to say car wash. He said, it was a defining moment in my life. He said, and I was 18, 19 years of age at home Friday night watching summer reruns with my parents. He said, but when I went back to Bible college that fall, it was an integrity in my heart and in my soul that I had done what is right, even though my friends had deserted me and had publicly shamed me. Joseph, the young man, did this even though it cost him his reputation, and here is where I want to stop and stay. <laughs> Jesus is the one who changes sinful life. Jesus is the one. You're there in the Bible. If you still got your Bible open, you still got your, your hand out, go to, verse, go to verse 20 again. Go to verse 20. But while he thought of these things, both the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, fear not taking thee, marry thy wife, that which is conceived in hers of the Holy Ghost. She shall bring forth a son. Thou shalt call his name Jesus, Joshua, Jehoshua, for he shall save his people from their sins. Mary, the mother, earthly mother of Christ, needed a Savior. Joseph, the stepfather of Jesus, needed a Savior. Joseph, with integrity of heart, because he looked for the one who would come, and then soon he'd be able to hold the Savior of the world in his arms. God is the one who changes stories. God is the one who goes, boy, that wasn't the thing you should have done there, but I can take and redeem that. I can take and we can restart a new family. And you may have messed up in that marriage, but man, we can do better now. And with the grace of God, the forgiveness of God, you may not have done what you should have done as a young person or as a 20 or a 30 or a 40 year old, but you can live in integrity now. You can live to honor and to please God now. God's a God not a second chance, but third chance and fourth and fifth chances. And I want to believe as long as you've got breath, as long as God is still dealing with you, there's still hope for you and your life to change. And it's not about perfect people polishing halos. It's about sinful people being redeemed by a loving Heavenly Father who sent His precious Son to die for sins. See, the message of Christmas is that you matter. Broken, bruised, and battered. You matter with all the regrets of life and all the things I should have done, all the people I should have listened to. You matter with the inconsistency. And God comes along and changes everything. And changes everything. That's the story of Christmas. That's Christmas at home. That's Christmas at home. What's church for? Church is for a bunch of people with a bunch of baggage to come and exchange all that baggage for Jesus' forgiveness. It's to come and go, man, I sure have messed up a lot of things. And God says, I know all about them, and I died for all those things, and I want to change your life. It's about a place where the, where the ground is level at the foot of the cross. It's about a place where you can come, and wherever how you came in, you can leave differently. And God began to work and to change your heart and your life. You say, preacher, you're going through some of these things. Man, I felt real convicted. Good, I felt real convicted too. <laughs> but I feel pretty happy remembering that the Savior came to save people from their sins. And to change lives. And everything can be different. He came to change young people's lives, save them from all kind of things. He came to save adult lives, save us out of a lot of things. God is the life changer. He is the story changer. He is the amazing chain breaker. He is the one who has come. I read this and I put it in your notes and I can close with this. Close with this. We're done for Matthew and for us. Salvation from sin is not just, Lord, Lord, I, you know, I'm in a jam. I'm in a bind. It's not just an empty whispered prayer. It is the promise of salvation, not just from the penalty of sin, but from sin's power, you don't have to stay the same. You don't have to stay in your sin. He can change it. He can clean up your mouth. He can change this. He can, all these kind of things. And you see this in these just preciously few verses in the life of Joseph. There is great power in righteous obedience. There is great power in righteous obedience. To change life. The life of this man, Joseph, 
See, Christmas at home is all about what God does in your heart. It is more than just a story. It's the start of your story as you encounter the risen, resurrected Lord.